And welcome back for another edition of the Syzygy Podcast. Joining me as ever, Emily Brunsden, Dr. Emily Brunsden from the University of York. And I'm looking at her on the Zoom right now and it's really, really exciting because the first time in I don't know how many months she's in her office. Emily, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Yes, I have made it not only to this correct hemisphere, shall we say, but also back into my office, which is it's nice. It's nice to be back. I never thought it would be exciting to see you in your office. That's that's not a <laughs> sentence I ever expected to say, but it kind of feels just another step in this process of getting back to something vaguely approximating the semblance of normal. Yeah? Excellent, yes. And maybe even one day you can too can come into my office. That'd be good and we could actually record it together in the same room at the same time and not have to use this intervening technology, which we're all grateful for, but frankly... Just getting a little bit tired of the Zoom and their ilk. So, yeah, it'd be really nice to be able to set up a couple of microphones in your office and actually eyeball you across the room and say, Emily, what's going on? And know that you're just there. You know, you're right there. I can't just close the window to get rid of you. That's right. That's right. We don't have to worry about the internet going down or anything. Anyway, so welcome back to your office. Welcome back, dear listeners, to the Syzygy podcast. This week, we're going to be talking about something that we we sort of tripped over in the astronomy news over the last couple of weeks, which I thought was really, really interesting. It's about one of our most farthest flung, you know, universal explorers, a little spacecraft called Voyager 1, which is winging its way well and truly out of the solar system by now. It's a very long way away now. But it's still doing stuff. And this is the thing that amazes me. It's, it, it's, we haven't just given up on it. We haven't just said, well, good luck, Voyager. Off you go. You know, let us know when you get to the nearest star. It's still taking measurements. And it's taken a couple of interesting measurements of the interstellar medium recently, which has come back to us as a little bit of a, a, little bit of a hum. It's humming to us, Emily. Voyager's found a hum. Yeah, which is cool. So we'll be talking about that today, about the Voyager spacecraft and what it's found. But in the meantime, there's a little bit of news. And this being 2021, being the year of sending stuff to Mars to roam around in the Martian soil. um, This time it's China's turn. Emily, what's been going on? Yeah, so China has successfully landed their rover and uh, just this week sent us back some beautiful pictures from the Martian surface. That's right. This is the, um, so the, the, the mission is the Chunwen 1 mission. Um, and they spent a bit of time in orbit looking around for just the right place to land. You know, they didn't just sort of put their hand over their eyes and go, well, just go, go and land down there. Spent a bit of time looking around, see where they could find. Decided on a place. And then what's the name of the rover? It's... A uh, Zuhong. Zhu, Zuhong, Zhu, Zuhong. Zhu, um, Zuhong. If we're, if we're getting that wrong, apologies yeah. to anyone who's, uh, who's listening. You can, you can uh, write to us and tell us how we're pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, but yeah, it made it. It got down. It's driving around and it's taken pictures, which is awesome. Well done, China. They, um, China's had one rover previously. We went and looked this up. It was a while ago, though, back in 1971. So this is just ever so slightly older than me. Um, their Mars 3 mission landed on Mars and its little rover called Prop M uh, started driving around but it was tethered it was tethered to the lander so it's not quite as autonomous as the one that's up there at the moment and it lasted uh, all of 104.5 seconds after landing so you really kind of hope they made the most of that slightly less than two minutes to get some really good (laughs) stuff going but when you consider 1971 that's uh, that's the best part of 50 years ago, he said, taking a deep breath and thinking about his own mortality. So well done, China, for getting number two down there. That was really awesome. Um, yeah, add that to the list of great stuff happening on Mars, I guess, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to have to have an episode coming up when we get the first results because uh, we're going to be looking for um, some subsurface water ice. So that's one of the main uh, scientific goals of this mission. Basically, it's landed in this Utopia Planetia, which is uh, this kind of basin. Sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's quite as utopic as maybe the package states but well, might have oversold it you reckon <laughs> i think maybe some time ago it was we think there probably was an ocean there in the past ah. so it's one of these kind of let's let's have a sort of a scratch around and see if we can find in some more evidence and figure out what was going on gotcha gotcha well looking forward to seeing some of the results coming back from that and also from the uh, the perseverance 
mission and its little helicopter, Jenny, um, which is which is buzzing around doing its thing. So, yeah, there's going to be all sorts of stuff coming in and we get to sift through that in a future episode. So looking forward to that one. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about Voyager. Voyager 1, to be precise, because there are two Voyagers, are there not, Emily? There are, there are two, two Voyagers. Yeah, yeah, there are, yeah. Yep, just two. Twins. Right. Now... Voyager 1 has just recently sent back some data to us about some measurements that it's been taking out there in what we now classify its, its region is the interstellar medium. Is that right, Emily? It's, it's, That's right, it's officially, yeah. for the last time, left the solar system? Because I seem to remember Voyager 1 leaving the solar system on more than one occasion, which is very confusing. Can you give us a little potted history of Voyager 1's progress to date? Where, where sure. is it exactly? <laughs> yeah, so well, Voyager uh, launched all the way back in uh, 1977, so it's just coming up to celebrating its 44th birthday. It's amazing that so, it's still going. I, I just incredible. cannot believe that. Yeah, so uh, Voyager uh, in the 70s um, went to the planets, um, very famously Saturn and Jupiter, and then used those as gravitational slingshots to kind of send itself out of the uh, solar system. So this was kind of part of the mission design was kind of we'll take some pictures of some planets and then we'll head out into just the space and we'll just kind of see what's there. Just keep going. Keep yeah. going. And the lovely thing is you can go to NASA's uh, mission page for Voyager and uh, and it'll give you for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 updating in real time the, uh, the mission stats. And so I'm looking at it right now and the distance of Voyager 1, so it was launched on... 5th of September, 1977. So that means it's been gone for 43 years, 8 months, 15 days, 23 hours, 55 minutes, and 22, 23, 24 seconds. It is 14... Hang on. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 4. That's 14 billion, 137 million, 583,790... That number's going up very quickly. Miles. Uh, and it's going yeah. very quickly. Now, for once, I can translate this into the, the kind of more sensible... Uh, human units, shall we say. It's about 152 times the Earth to Sun distance. Right. Astronomical units, AU. Exactly. You can see why astronomers glommed onto the whole AU thing, can't you? Because it's much easier to say 152 and a bit astronomical units than 14,137,583,972 miles, which is uh, a much harder number. To say. And already so, out of yeah. date. Yeah, and already out of date by a lot. Whereas the astronomical units, the AU, that's just buried way down in the decimal point there. So, yeah, 152 AU, which is a really long way. That's out well beyond even, like, we're, we're well beyond Pluto now, right? Exactly. Yeah, well, we're out of the solar system entirely. Okay. So, can we just spend a, just a moment? Can we just clarify that, please? When you say we're out of the solar system, like, I am sure I have heard on a number of occasions, that number being more than one, Voyager has left the solar system. So, either it has or it hasn't, I would have thought. Is is there some ambiguity about this? Was, was there sort of, now it's left the solar system? No, no, wait, wait, now it's left the solar system. What's going on? Well, there's a few ways you can sort of measure, try or try to measure the edge of the solar system. It turns out that it's not kind of just a, a wall where you, you open the door <laughs> and you carry on into the next uh, thing. It's not like the Truman Show where you get to sort of the edge and you just open the door and walk out into the into the universe. It doesn't work that way. No, and it, you can measure it in a couple of different ways. You can measure it based on things like the gravitational force from the sun. Um, but I think com the most common way we measure the edge of the solar system now is by uh, something called the heliopause or the um, the sun's kind of the sun has an electromagnetic um, dominance over our solar system so this the solar wind which is all the kind of charged particles and electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun that kind of gets to a point where that is overtaken by the interstellar medium so there's kind of a, there's a, a a point where basically the sun's electromagnetic influence becomes less than the influence of the interstellar medium. Right. And so depending on exactly how you define that, that's sort of a, a, a boundary in space where once you pass over this line, it's the, the, the influence on you is really from the universe at large or the galaxy at large rather than the sun. Is it a little bit like, you know, the wake behind a boat 
that when you're close to the boat as it's powering along, then the wake is the most dominant thing. You'll get dragged along behind the boat. But if you get a little bit too far away, then basically the boat's left you behind and you're now in the river or in the in the lake. Is it is it a little bit like that? Yeah, I tend to think about it as, um, I guess, in a similar way, but with like bubbles of dye or something like that, where you've got like, I don't know, uh, maybe something like an old traffic light cocktail, where you've got different layers of different colours. And there's, there's kind of a boundary, there's a little bit of mixing at the boundary, but you know, it's kind of a boundary between the different layers of the different colours of the I drinks. feel like your Friday nights are much more interesting than my Friday nights at this point in time, <laughs> Emily. But yeah, okay, let's let's take your your traffic light cocktail analogy and uh, and run with that one. Okay, so by that definition, which is according to, what did you say it was? The, the heliosphere? Yeah, the heliopause. Heliopause. Uh, then Voyager 1 is out. It's gone. Yes. It's gone through yep. that, that rough boundary and it's out. So it actually left it quite a long meeting. time ago. It left it in 2012. That is so, a while ago. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I mean, it was a measured um, leaving of the solar system in a sense that like Voyager has lots of sensors on board so it was able to detect the change in its um, environment basically as it moved away from that electromagnetic influence of the sun and then you might remember not too long ago Voyager 2 did the same thing I think it was about 2016-ish somewhere around there that Voyager 2 also left the solar system It's always possible I guess that my memory of hang on haven't we heard this before is conflating Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 separately leaving the solar system. But I'm fairly certain that the definition of where the end of the solar system is has also been a little bit hazy over the years as well. Anyway, so Voyager 1 is out there. The staggering thing is that it's still taking measurements. It's brilliant. It's still, it's still measuring stuff. And not only that, it's sending it back to us. So that's very, very cool. Now, I'm having a look again at this Voyager mission page. And... It says that the one-way light time, which is the communication time, right, back to back to Earth or from Earth to Voyager, Voyager back to Earth, um, is 21 hours, just over 21 hours. So that's that's a really long time. <laughs> it's a very, very long way away. When you consider how long does it take light to get from the sun to us? It's like eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yeah. So it's eight light minutes to the sun. And it's, what, a couple of light seconds to the moon? Mm -hmm. And how long does it take us to communicate with the rovers on Mars? Uh, just a few more minutes, about eight, uh, 12 minutes, something about like that. 12 minutes. So it's 12 light minutes to Mars. And this is the best part of a light day away. So it's really getting out there. Um, I'm also going to notice that it is currently traveling at 38,000 miles an hour, which is very fast in anyone's language. See, that's great because when I was a PhD student, we used to do things like, um, well, you'd, you'd write some code to do a particular task, right? And then you'd have to push go on the code and it's like, well, hey, my code's running. I can't possibly do anything else. Let's go get a coffee or you know, <laughs> lunch or <laughs> a few drinks at the bar, whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> Those cocktails you're talking about. So yeah, where they so came in. Can we yeah. have a few traffic lights, please? Yeah. Um, but it's only 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Code's running. Yeah, yeah. Code's going to be hours. It's fine. Can you imagine being a, um, a controller and pushing the button and waiting not just 21 hours for your code to get to Voyager, but then another 21 hours to get the signal back saying, yeah, received, I'm on it. <laughs> yeah. Or the code that says, didn't quite catch that. Can you send it again? Oh, fine. Back to the bar. <laughs> so... One of the other things that, that's on this fabulous mission webpage is the instrument status. So it's listed Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. And I can see that of the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so of the 10 different instruments set up, 10 different measuring, measuring apparatus uh, on the Voyager spacecraft, um, four are still alive on Voyager 1 and five are alive, or at least turned on, on Voyager 2. Two. So Voyager 1's currently got its cosmic ray subsystem on, its low energy charged particles subsystem on, its magnetometer, measuring magnetic fields, is on, and its plasma wave subsystem is on. Voyager 2 also has its plasma science system turned on. Um, so 44 years later, Sorry, 43 years later, let's not exaggerate. 43 years later, it's still got these four different um, scientific systems up and running. How is it powered? Where is it yeah. getting its electricity from? 
Yeah, no, it is powered spacecraft. But yeah, most of the other subsystems were purposely shut down. Yeah. Um, especially as uh, Voyager 1 moved away, or and both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 moved away, because you just don't need things like um, cameras, it turns out, anymore, because there's nothing to take a picture of. So uh, these things, yeah, some of these things, and, the, and also some of the instruments that were designed to do measurements of the planets, of course, were all shut down. And this is just to conserve power. And it's interesting that you mentioned, because that last... Um, uh, detector that you measured is uh, you mentioned is the plasma wave subsystem, yes. and that's exactly what has been making the measurements that we're talking about today. Exactly. So why don't we get to that? What is it that Voyager has actually picked up and sent back to us? Going, oh, this is fun. Look what I just heard. Yeah. So with the plasma wave subsystem, which to you and I, I think we'd call it something quite different. Um, I don't know if you've got your picture up there of Voyager and what it looks I, like. I have. So hang on, let me see if I can find. Maybe which one is the so, plasma wave subsystem. So, I mean, the, the image of Voyager is very iconic by now. Uh, if, you, if you don't know what we're talking about, listeners, go and have a look. Just find a picture of Voyager. But basically, you've got your big dish, which is pointed back towards Earth, I assume. And it's for, for picking up stuff from us and sending stuff back to us. And then behind that is sort of housed this ring of stuff that's where all the electronics is and presumably the power source um and then you've got a bunch of antennae and and um instruments coming off it so there's a long thin one which is the planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna so that's that one sticking that's just a long thin thing you've got a thing which kind of looks like a camera and that's a radio isotope thermo thermoelectric generator is that its power source? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's its, that's its nuclear power source, I'm guessing. It's got a, a mag, uh, magnetometer boom, which is a long sort of almost looks like a, um, a, a radio mast sticking out of it. All sorts of bits and pieces sticking out of it. But this long, thin rod is your planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna. So that would be your plasma wave yeah. subsystem. So there's a, it's actually just like basically... 10 meter long bunny ears that you used to have on your television. <laughs> Back in the days really before you is. connected into the wall, you had to fiddle with the bunny ears. And that's basically all this is. It's, it's detecting what? Electromagnetic signals in space. Exactly, yeah. Right. So it's got its bunny ears going. And with the bunny ears, uh, Voyager 1, um, well, we've, we've actually heard uh, recently from Voyager 1, it's been detecting uh, things like eruptions from the sun. And these come through um, the you know, through the interplanetary space, which is our solar system. And then they do, you know, mix up and head out into the interstellar medium. Uh, and especially when there's kind of a big, ex a big eruption, a big explosion, you get this big kind of wave of charged particles, this wave traveling through the whole um, system. And then several of those have been picked up um, over the last few years. And we've seen those. Um, and they're about one a year, actually, that Voyager seems to pick up from that. But what they've uh, managed to do now is to actually look at the times when you don't have these kind of eruptions that you're picking up and actually investigate what's going on in the background uh, of the, the detections and see what actually what's the interstellar medium just doing out there. And it's this um, hum that they've picked up in the interstellar medium at a particular frequency that they've been able to study and really identify as kind of, I guess, the first direct detection of this type of the interstellar medium. Which is very cool when you consider that, first of all, that hum or, or any of that background noise is normally something that you'd want to be able to get rid of because the, the signal that you're interested in, the signal, for example, from the sun that you just described, is the important part and anything else is just distraction so if we can just reduce any background noise get rid of it or at least you know account for it and and push it aside great but now that that we're out of the solar system during quiet times we can actually go well let's go back and have a look at that noise again and characterize that because now that's something of interest for the first time we're actually out there in the interstellar medium and we can have a look around and see so what 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 is this what is this thing that i am in says voyager one so emily tell us a little bit about the interstellar medium what what is voyager in at the moment 
Yeah, well, it's it's in a much sort of more soupy thing, I think, than we often give it credit for. I mean, we we often would talk about spaces not having anything in it, and that's yeah. you know broadly true, but it's not really as true as you might imagine. So the interstellar medium is just defined as the space between stars. And because we're in our galaxy and then we have the space between stars is filled up with the stuff that um, moves in and out of stars as they go through their life cycles. So it's got gas, it's got dust, it's got cosmic rays, um, it's got most of um, these or m much of these um, sort of particulate stuff, if you like, the, the matter, the visible matter um, actually exists in the form of a plasma. So you can have different forms of matter. You can have um, you can have molecules, for example. You have hydrogen. You can have atoms of hydrogen. You can have ions of hydrogen, and you can have plasma, which is kind of a soupy uh, sea of the ions. So the electrons and uh, the protons disassociate it from one another. Yeah. So let's let's pull that that plasma apart a little bit, as it were. The people talk about plasma as being the fourth state of matter, right? that you know, you'd be familiar with solids, which is where atoms or molecules are kind of connected together in a, in a reasonably fixed way, whether it's as a crystal or just as an amorphous lump of stuff. The atoms are stuck together and they keep their shape. Add a bit of energy to that and the atoms, the molecules can start sliding around each other and you get a liquid and it can flow and take up the shape of its container. You add a bit more energy to that and the atoms or the molecules are able to pull apart from each other and you get a gas. And again, it's a fluid. It can take the shape of whatever container it's in, but the atoms and molecules are separated now. There's space between them. They can collide and bang into each other, but there's space there. But you add more energy again and you start pulling the atoms or the molecules actually apart elect electromagnetically. You start pulling the charges apart and you've got electrons and you've got charged ions floating around in a gas or a plasma as it's called and so i'm guessing that that the plasma that's in the interstellar medium is a pretty dispersed one it's very very thin i think i'm thinking yeah there's not a lot it's, there I'm, I'm it's absolutely well it's low density but there's a lot of it if that makes sense because space is big well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if when, let's let's pick apart two, both of those things. So okay. first of all, we've got low density. So for low density, we're talking about um, kind of something like 0 0.1 atoms. So a tenth of an atom for every centimeter cubed. Okay, so holding up my fingers in front of me, centimeter apart, there's a centimeter cubed little box. So basically a die, right? Uh, a, a, a game die sitting in front of me. And that would have a tenth of an atom on average in it. I'd need ten in, of in those. The plasma, in the plasma state of the wow. interstellar medium. So, okay, yeah. that's there's not a lot. Not much, no. no. And, I mean, you can compare that to, say, um, a molecular cloud, which is kind of like what you might see in a nice um, astronomical image. You might see dark clouds, some molecular yeah. clouds. Um, they might have something like a billion molecules in there centimeter cubed right so when we say that the interstellar medium is quite empty that's what we mean that it's not completely yep, that, empty but there that, is yeah, stuff that's, there that's still quite empty but that's yeah. that's quite quite empty yeah okay and so then if you want to i guess the next level up would be if you think about ultra high vacuums that we can create here on earth i think you're usually talking about so um you've got a million of 10 to the 6 and then you go to a billion at 10 to the 9 so you're talking about about 10 billion atoms per centimeter cubed in an ultra high vacuum so that's okay in a sorry in an ultra high vacuum that we can make you know cutting edge technology here on earth we can get the density of the gas down to 10 billion atoms per centimeter cubed that's that's as low as we can do. It sounds pretty rubbish, doesn't it? It does a bit, really, when you talk about it that way. And so that's still 10, what did you say? That's still 10 times higher than, than, an in, than a dust cloud yes, in space? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we're not even to that level. And then you get to the interstellar medium, which is a tenth of an atom per centimetre cubed. That's... Oh, that's quite yeah, vacuumed. But maybe we shouldn't be too harsh on ourselves because really what we're dealing with on Earth, of course, is going from atmospheric... Um, 
you know, atoms around mm-hmm. us, say the air that we breathe. And, and in terms of the atmosphere, then you're looking at something like 10 to the power of 19 atoms or molecules Which per is a centimetre lot. cubed. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, in getting down to 10 billion, we've done well. <laughs> that's, yeah. You know, that's no small feat, but it's still a really long way from space type vacuums. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. So cleared that one up. It's not empty, but it's pretty damn close to empty. There's not a lot there. But that doesn't mean that you can't detect what is there. And certainly not. And and you shouldn't um, sort of brush it aside as being kind of the stuff that doesn't matter because actually, although it's very sparse on average, uh, there are well, there are things in the interstellar medium which uh, are much more dense. You know, it's clumpy. It's not a uniform density. There are things like nebula. There are gas clouds. There are things that you can see in the night sky even, and things like the Orion Nebula. But uh, when you put it all together, it actually makes up something like fifteen percent of the visible matter in our galaxy. What all of that 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 the tiny fragment of an atom per centimetre cubed? Add all of that up across all of the space, and that's 15% of everything we see. We've got a big galaxy, a really yeah. big galaxy. This, uh, we're once again getting back into the space really just blows your mind, doesn't it? <laughs> certainly does. It certainly does. All right, so one shouldn't ignore it, even though there's not a hell of a lot within any given volume. It's still incredibly important stuff. Exactly, yeah. And so you've got this medium, this sort of stuff is there, and waves travel through this medium, Right, so you get shocks and so on that travel through. The biggest one, the biggest wave that you can uh, measure that travels through the interstellar medium, comes from actually the whole bulk rotation of the galaxy itself. So we, um, if you imagine a picture of a very very typical spiral galaxy that you might have seen um, in any any Hubble picture of the Whirlpool galaxy. Anything like that. That's a really, fairly good representation of what our galaxy looks like. Yes. If you're listening to this, look down at your if – you, if you're looking at it on a, on a device which will show you chapter art, then uh, you'll be able to look at an image of it right now. So have a look. So we have this beautiful spiral galaxy. So we've got a disk, and that disk rotates, and the spiral arms rotate um, – around with it. Well, actually, the spiral arms are part of a density wave that's propagating through the galaxy. And so that's the biggest sort of scale of waves that we have in the interstellar medium, where each of the waves is like a few tens of light years, if you like, in size. I just I can't, really, really big. I can't comprehend that, though, because it's like, but as, as soon as I think about that, I think it's it's on such a scale through a medium with such low density it's a little bit like, you know, being being an ant on a surface of a balloon. You have no concept at all that the balloon stretches around in a in a in a circle or anything like that. You just you only see the bit be so like, how the hell do we measure that? That's that just doesn't seem possible, Emily. Well, the, those waves are quite slow, but what we we measure it just from the structure of the galaxy itself because those right. density waves cause the pile-ups and material which actually go into forming the the spiral arms. Okay, so those are the biggest ones. Yeah. We also then get sort of more explosive waves which propagate through the galaxy. Uh, and these come from things like supernova explosions. So a big star goes through an enormous explosion at the end of its life. And that explosion therefore sends ripples effectively out through the interstellar medium. So these are on the next sort of scale down. They're on maybe sort of tens of astronomical units or tens of times the the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's so that but they're very, very high energy, so they, they propagate very, very far. Are those uh those waves something that can be detected directly? I mean you said the the previous ones, um, which are sort of on the on the scale of the structure of the galaxy, we see those through their effects on the structure of the galaxy. Um these supernova ones, is it just that we kind of know that they must be there or can we actually detect those? We can detect them and we've seen them in some of the nearby supernovae. So in our galaxy, uh, or I guess in our um, neighbouring galaxy when 1987A went, you can see the bow shock from that uh, supernova as one example. I mean, it doesn't look kind of like you're not watching it happening yeah. In real time, these You're things not watching are it so, spread out they're, they're across fast, the galaxy. But they're, they're slow on our. It's yeah, they're, they're going very very large distances, so yeah. they look like it's quite slow. 
Um, but they're absolutely super important to the interstellar medium because it's those shocks that then um, contract and push material together. So if you've got a sort of a cloud that's a molecular cloud that's kind of kicking around, minding its own business, if it gets shocked by a supernova, that can be enough to trigger it into collapse and actually start to form new stars. Right. So that's the kind of dynamics that leads to cycles of, of evolution of, of stars formed, going through their lives, blowing up and causing the um, the creation of new stars from the from the stuff that's lying around in the galaxy. Yeah. And I guess then the smallest kind of um, shocks that you get through the interstellar medium are the ones that come from the stars themselves. So stars can have pretty volatile surfaces. Some stars are really like quite energetic and quite nasty, um, particularly baby stars, actually, when they're, you know, very new new stars often have a lot of, um, I guess, uh, t you can maybe call it teething problems, <laughs> getting coming together as a star. There's a lot of explosive activity that happens. Um, and Hashtag there are relatable also... for all of the parents, yep. <laughs> Indeed. And there's also some particular types of stars that just periodically erupt uh, of their own accord as well. But even, you know, ordinary day-to-day uh, -day stars like our sun, you know, we have coronal mass ejections, which are an enormous releases of energy off the surface of the star. And that propagates, as we've now measured from Voyager 1, out into the interstellar medium. So you get these small but still very detectable shock waves traveling out through the, the incredibly diffuse material of the, of the medium. But it's, but it's there. It's sending this wave shock out yeah. through the universe. And then we can measure them because what happens is those um, waves are traveling through this plasma. So remember, plasma's got particularly the electrons in the plasma. So these are the negatively charged particles. Those waves cause the electrons to start to oscillate or to ring at a particular frequency. And that frequency is dependent on how what the density of the electrons is at that particular point. So if you have a lot of electrons close together, it's a high density of electrons, then you get a higher pitch to your ringing sound. Ah, and is, is this what Voyager has heard? Is this the hum? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm using sound very loosely here. It's mm -hmm. actually a bit naughty because, of course, there's, <laughs> there's not enough material in space in the interstellar medium for audio, for no. the, me the mechanical propagation of sound as we hear it. <laughs> so when we say hum, what are we what are we analogizing there then? So we're talking about an electromagnetic sort of frequency, so um, a, a photonic frequency. Okay, so you could we're, we're sort of making that <laughs> that direct connection between. Okay, so there is a hum in the sense of an electromagnetic vibration, which you can think of as a bit like a hmm, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and the one that's, that Voyager 1's picked up is running at about 3 kilohertz. If you were to transpose that into something, yeah, from, from, from the electromagnetic yeah. signal into, into an something audio that signal, we can hear, yeah. Uh, then what you would hear is um, you'd hear the note. Let's say a particular frequency corresponds to a particular note. So you'd hear that consistent note just playing, just a single note, monotone, brrr, something <laughs> like that. Um, but it is actually interesting because this, this note slowly changes with time because as Voyage is traveling, it's traveling through the interstellar medium, which has very slightly different densities. And so you hear the um, pitch change because the frequency is changing because the density of the electrons is changing. Ah, and is it, is it generally getting lower the further away from the solar system it gets or is it now far enough out that it's basically just little fluctuations as it goes along? It's, it's fluctuations. So the, the pitch um, rose from 2013 to 2015. Uh, and it now seems to be, I think it's sort of steady since then. Um, and so we can infer from that that the Voyager has gone from a slightly lower density part of the interstellar medium to a slightly higher part. Something by 40 times increase, which sounds a lot, I think. But Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, when you're dealing with such small densities... You know that you, you're not going to see an enormous amount around you in, the, in that change, but it's still a significant change. You know, 40, 40 times is still forty times. There's no, there's no getting away from yeah. that. Yeah, so it's worth having a listen to these things. And this is actually um, a recording from um, of Voyager's frequency uh, detections from two thousand and uh, I think it's two thousand seventeen or so. So it's actually got the solar 
eruptions in it, which is what you're hearing. But right. it's the background in this kind of recording that is the hum of the interstellar medium that sits behind that. That's spooky. You get a little whistle there. That's kind of spooky. I like that. It does sound a little creepy, doesn't it? It does a bit. So the the whistles that it's hearing, that's from, you're saying that's from the sun. Yep. And then what they're focusing on now is more of the that gentle background hum. Mm. That, um, that, again, as I said before, is the thing which we weren't is interested in when we were focusing on what the sun was, was talking about. But now we're tuning into, okay, so... What is, what is in that hum? What's going on there? And mm-hmm. measuring the changes as Voyager chugs off towards infinity. Yeah, and if you listen to that, you should hear a very slight rise in the pitch of that background, which is what we're talking about, the, the change in the density. Very cool, very cool. So, Emily, what is it that, you know, being able to tune into this and measure it is extraordinary enough. You know, that, that, that's enough to be able to look at and go, wow, that's cool. But what is it that we're learning from this? What can we find out about the interstellar medium thanks to our aging but still very intrepid Voyager 1 spacecraft? Well, it's so important because this is one of the only ways that we can directly probe it is obviously by sending something out into it. Uh, we've only got Voyager 1, Voyager 2, the two our only two probes that are sitting out there in the interstellar medium. And uh, it's so important we understand it because it's the interstellar medium is the link between different generations of stars. So when stars are born, they're born from this cloud of gas and dust that's in the interstellar medium. And then they sit around and have their merry lives as a hydrogen fusing uh, object. But then when they die, and there's lots of different ways a star can die, but no matter which way they die, eventually most of that material gets returned back into this medium. And so stars are are the great recyclers of our galaxy, right? Every generation is picking up all the stuff that's left over from the generation beforehand. And so to understand stellar evolution, which you can argue is probably the most important cyclic process in our universe, you have to understand that relationship between stars and the interstellar medium. And that's only then you can figure out things like galactic evolution. How's a galaxy going to evolve? Well, it's all because the stars are evolving, the interstellar medium's evolving. So it's it's really foundational, I think, to understanding just how stuff works out there. It's staggering. Do, do you think this was built into Voyager's mission plan from the beginning? Like, did, do you know whether was was this the intent? You know, we'll we'll get it out there, and then we'll just keep measuring stuff for years and years and years, and it'll get out into the into the interstellar medium, and we'll be able to measure that too. Or is it just kind of lucky at this? Point? I think it absolutely was the hope um, of you know, because these some of these instruments were only really designed to be able to start picking things up once they got a significant distance from the sun. Right. Now, whether that was specifically designed to traverse into the interstellar medium or not, I'm not quite sure, but. Definitely, I think it w- it's an ambition that was made to say, well, can we, you know, build these things to leave the solar system and to carry on and just go out into the universe forever? I think about the uh, the golden record that's on Voyager that was yeah. done with such hope and optimism that it will be found one day. Yeah, but I mean, there's a difference between we're going to send a hunk of, you know, metal and stuff off into the cosmos and maybe one day it'll bump into someone versus this thing is actually still going under its own power. Do you know how long it's it's going to keep going? Like, when does its power run well, out? Well, sadly, probably not a huge amount longer. So this sort of stuff is really important. Um, the best estimates are between somewhere in four and six years' time. Right. So it really is coming towards the end of its operational lifetime now. It is, yeah. yeah. And they'll be, you know, they'll be able to maybe tweak that a little bit depending on what instruments can be shut down and so yeah. on between now and then. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting that we might actually get to see a 50-year-old spacecraft uh, yeah. before it uh, ends yeah. its life. As someone who's getting quite close to being 50 years himself, that gives me hope in a strange way. Um, but it will be a really sad, won't that be such a sad day when it's announced, yeah, you know what, it's it's gone. We, we turned it off and we're just 
you know, wishing it well on its travels off into the cosmos because we're never going to hear it from it again. That, that'll be a sad day. It will be sad. But Voyager will keep going. You know, it's still going to, it's got a trajectory. It's got a velocity. It's not it's just going to stop in its tracks. No, it's, no, it's, it's, gonna no, it's carry going on at 38,000 miles an hour at this point. <laughs> And we've done a lot of calculations to figure out where it's going to end up one day, which is, is kind of cool. Uh, so in about 300 years' time, it's going to enter the Oort cloud. Uh, this is, Oort cloud is kind of the uh, very, very extended um, sphere of small, massive bodies, which kind of tag along with the sun. Uh, sometimes very, very extreme objects might come from the Oort cloud or... Uh, things that may then eventually move into the Kuiper belt and become comets, that sort of thing. But it's just kind of an extra bit of stuff that's out there. So the Oort cloud, it's not considered to be part of the solar system, but it's still within the sun's influence. It's still, still yeah. gravitationally bound to the sun? Yeah. So well, remember that the sun's gravitational influence goes to approximately halfway to the distance to the nearest star, right? Because yeah. gravity yeah. just doesn't switch off no. uh, <laughs> whenever you get a certain distance away. Uh, it's just that then you become more attracted to the next thing over. Right. right. So the Oort cloud is, is all the little bits and pieces which are caught up on our side of that boundary between the, the sun and the, the nearest star along. Once you cross over that other side of the halfway point, then that other star gets its own Oort-esque cloud. And, uh, and so did you say in, in about 300 years? So in 300 years, it's going to enter the Oort cloud, but it's not going to be until 300,000 years time that it's going to leave it. What? Space is ridiculous, Emily. Like what? The, uh, uh. Okay, here's a here's a question for you, which 30, may or 000. may not be. No, I, I said that wrong. I said it wrong. N wrong number of num zeros. Still a big number. Oh. <laughs> Still a really no, but it's big important. Number. It's a really important. Yeah, so three hundred years to th thirty thousand years is when Voyager is going to be in the Oort cloud. And the reason why that's important is because the next milestone, which I think is kind of the coolest one actually, is in fifty thousand years then this is when Voyager will be at the distance of, say, our nearest star. Right. It's not going to the nearest star. It's not pointed no. in that direction. But that's – in. so in how many years? In 50,000 years. 50,000 years it'll be at the distance of the next star, but not at the next star because that's not where it's going. So that's a long time to wait to even get that far. Where, where is it going? Well, just kind of into space. <laughs> so if you imagine, um, imagine the sun's going around the galaxy, right? The sun's going on its orbit. It's mm -hmm. going on an approximately circular orbit around the galaxy. Then both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were sent out because the because the sun's moving around the galaxy, it's it's um, heliopause, it's um, electromagnetic sort of bubble is not a sphere. It's actually nice. got a long tail nice. because it's moving. Yeah. So Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 were sent out to be going ahead of the sun, if you like, so that they could leave that bubble sooner. Because if they went tail to the tail, then it would just take ages to get out. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. So they were flung uh, one, I guess, slightly above the um, the plane of the orbit of the planets and one slightly below. Now you can decide which way is up to decide which one is above and which is <laughs> below. How do we do that? Is that based on north south here here at Earth? Do we do we define the North Pole to be up? Is that I, I think it is defined, but it never made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I'd never really thought of that before, but yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But, okay, but then let's that whole that. Um, system's on its side when it comes to the galaxy anyway. So, I mean, it's you always sort of just loosely assume that the, the planets are going around the sun in the same plane of, as the disk of the galaxy. They're not? No, no, really? we're, we're, totally, we're, t we're really tipped over. Wow. Okay. Clock that one up for new knowledge for the day for me. Ah, oh, yes, I'd always assumed that we were roughly in the same plane, but we're not. There you are. No, no, the the, the sort of gravitational um, force that's pulled together the the disk of the the galaxy is is insignificant compared to the um, rotation of the sun, which is what pulled together the disk, which became the planets around right. that. 
I guess that makes sense. But yes, mind blown at this point. There we are. So they're going out roughly ahead of the sun as it plows its way around the, the, the galaxy. And I'm assuming they weren't sort of directed in any specific direction with an end point in mind. They're just, it's, it's now a matter of, so what direction are they going? I wonder where they're going to end up. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you can find out. You can see that it's, it's going to um, – I think that there's there's some calculations as to when they're going to reach other stars. And by, by reach other stars, I mean – some of these calculations are when they're within a light year of the next star, which is not yeah. really reaching, but it's, it's not. But I mean, on the scales, the distant scales we're talking about, that's, you know, that's close enough, surely. Yeah, but it's still much, much further than even the Earth is from the sun. Yeah. So it's, it's, I guess, flybys. It's, yeah. it's all going to be flybys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, given that at this point, it'll be a completely and utterly dead, cold lump of metal with you know, an, an inscribed record on it. It's, um, you know, it's a bit of a moot point anyway. But it's, yeah, statistically, eventually, it's going to get modestly close to something. Exactly, yeah. What I also find interesting, though, is that Voyager 1 is probably always going to be the furthest man-made object from the Earth. How do you mean? Because so it's, it's currently the fur furthest man-made object from the Earth, right? Yeah. And it's got um, a speed, and I can't remember what the speed is, but it's traveling at, yeah, you know, it's, it's chugging along. Yeah, moving away from us. Uh, its speed, by the way, is um, I can I can read this out for you. It is currently going at um, seventeen kilometers a second. Nice. Yeah. So, Voyager two um, is slightly closer to the Earth. Not not hugely. Actually, Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1 by a few days, but it's not quite going as fast. So it's not, and it went at a funny angle. So it's not going, it's not furthest away. So yeah, Voyager it's only furthest. going at 15.4 kilometers a second. So, you know, relatively slow. Hmm. And okay, well, you could say, well, well, what's the next kind <clears> of <throat> um, space probe that's going to go out there and into the uh, interstellar medium? I guess... Probably the next one, at least the one that springs to my mind, would be New Horizons, which nice. went out, uh, when was that launched? Maybe around 2005, 2006, something like that. Now, New Horizons is not actually going as fast as Voyager 1. So it's never going to catch up. Right, and now so... you're at the point where you're 50 years later. Even if we launch something today, is it going to be able to go fast enough to actually ever catch up? You'd really need to be moving, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, oh, here we go. It's going at uh, 16 kilometers per second. Oh, that's about the same speed. That's about the same speed as Voyager 1, but it's behind by the best part of 30 years. So <laughs> it's, got to, it's not going to catch up at that rate. No. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, maybe you're right. Voyager 1 is going to forever be our most far-flung thing in the, in the universe, wherever it ends up. Which is a very strange thought, isn't it? Most of the time when you do yeah. think look at space exploration or whatever, um, advances in any kind of scientific field, you never expect something to have a record that it maintains forever in yeah. that sense. Yeah. I mean, unless, you know, unless and then until we start developing some really extraordinarily good, um, uh, you know, propulsion systems for presumably interstellar travel – uh, there's no chance of catching up on this one. So, yeah. So we've got a couple of years of data left from uh, from Voyager 1, we think, and then it's off into the void little spacecraft. Good luck to you. Well, that brings us to the end of this Voyager-tastic episode of the Syzygy podcast. Emily, I... I don't know, there's something about the notion of this tiny little dot of human-made stuff flinging itself out across the void uh, on, a, on an endless mission out into the stars that is at once both inspiring and, and makes me feel incredibly small. <laughs> I, think, I think it's, if nothing else, it puts the most extraordinary perspective on humanity's place in the universe. And I don't know, that's not a bad thing. 
Kraken, what do you think? I just love the idea of Voyager going out into the, the inky blackness, this tiny little thing. It's only, you know, the size of a, a kind of a slightly large table hidden out and out there. Um, just doing its own thing. Just uh, It's almost like the Sputnik beep, just kind of yeah. hidden on. I don't know. It's suddenly, I, I know there's always a danger in anthropomorphizing these things but it just feels very brave you know it must it must kind of feel very dark and alone out there and i i feel for voyager one so if you can if you can hear us voyager then we're with you we're with you all the way we're cheering you on we think you're great but listen we should probably wrap this one up so ladies and gentlemen listening out there in listener land if you want to get in touch with us here on the syzygy podcast for any reason whether that's to ask us a question just to say hi to suggest a, a an idea for an upcoming show or just to throw some interesting tidbits from the world of astronomy our way emily there must be all sorts of ways that people can do that how do people get in touch they can get in touch and interestingly none of these things were around when voyager was launched that's right goodness me there wasn't even an internet wow it wasn't even but you you have the benefit of the uh, modern day right. times of being able to contact us, us on twitter so we are at suzuji pod at s-y-z-y-g-y-p-o-d that's right we are you can bang in suzuji pod into that little search box on facebook and we will ping and very occasionally we throw stuff up on the Instagrams as well. So we you just go and find us at SyzygyPod on the uh, the Instagrams. We also have a website, I think. Oh, yes. Uh, Syzygy.fm. Beautiful pictures, beautiful extra links, and a lot of dark rabbit holes to go down. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's full of rabbit holes, our webpage, as well as a, uh, a, a page dedicated to all of our fabulous supporters. It's the um, the Great Wall of Gratitude, named after the Cosmic Great Wall, which has got something to do with very large-scale cosmology. I'll have to go and remind myself of that one. But the Cosmic Great Wall of Gratitude, where everyone who has financially supported the show through our Patreon page, go over to patreon.com slash syzygypod. And if you want to become a financial member of the show, then you can do that there for as little as you know a dollar or a quid a week or a month to help us keep the electrons flowing through the website and help us to do the things that we love to do on the podcast but you don't have to be a financial member to help out the show you can just give us a review on your podcast player of choice throw some stars and a couple of kind words to help other people find us and share in the joy or you can just tell everyone you know find that friend of yours who loves astronomy and say there's this thing i've been listening to think you might like it otherwise i think we should probably call it a day there emily so i will catch up with you in probably a week or so's time for another episode what do you reckon sounds like a good plan all right well i will catch you later see you later emily see you later bye everybody 